never say, I don't know, well, maybe one time I have since we've been doing it, but if you're watching online, welcome and hi. Uh, you wish you were here, but you're at the next best place. So it's good to have you. Glad that that's uh, there for any that can't make it tonight. <clears throat> Glad to have you guys. We've been uh, friends for a long time. And uh, they've been friends to our ministry, and it's good to have them. Um, I always wonder what Renato's going to say. And uh, when you give him a extra time to say more, you wonder a little bit more. But it's got to the point where I never feel I have to correct anything anymore or anything. I just say, <laughs> let him go. <laughs> let Renato be Renato, because he's so good at it. And I love him, love them all. Walter and Eddie, they're, they're three great brothers. Isn't it neat to have three brothers in love with the Lord? Oh, and uh, I mean, th this is three brothers that have, if you use the term, work ministry for 25 years. Who, who's done that? I mean, they're all still alive and everything. I mean, a lot of brothers uh, don't work that well. <laughs> um, you know, it says in Psalms 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Psalms 147, verse 1, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Psalms 95, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Oh, sing to the Lord, Psalms 96. A new song, sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. It's good to sing to the Lord. It's good for our souls. It's, there is a benefit we get, though we are not the object of worship, we are called to, to worship God. It says in John 4, 24, to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, he has a, a way that's, that's right that we're going to look at just quickly um, that's from the heart, that's intimate. And then there's a way that is wrong. It says in Acts 17, right, Paul's checking everything out and there's all this different idols of worship and everything. And he goes, you worship what you don't know. I'm going to present to you the unknown God. You're not worshiping the right God. It, it says... In Colossians 2.23, there's a show of wisdom in their worship and humility, but it's not good worship. Jesus said in Matthew, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they draw near with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain or in emptiness they worship me, and they teach the doctrines of men like they come from God. Well, there's a definite ignorant or wrong way um, and there's definitely a right way in a in a great way um, one of the biggest problems in worship that we can have in modern day worship is making the worshiper the center of attraction or the object of affection that's a big issue uh, the you know some of the phrases we use like, get my worship on in that one song. It's like, you don't, you don't get worship. You worship. You worship God. It's not your worship to get on. Um, and it tells us back in the Psalms, right, we sing a new song. Because there's new, fresh stuff God does in our lives, isn't there? We can always be singing a new song. You know, I have this story of something the Lord did really awesome this week. Who wants to hear it? Or you could hear a story 10 years ago that I told about eight times from the pulpit. Which one do you want? Both? Okay, well, that was just an a illustration anyways. I'm not going to tell you anything. But, I mean, think about it. What do you want to hear? What, what happened 15 years ago and you've heard a dozen times? Or you want to hear something relevant? And that's what happens when there's so, God's doing something new in your life and he's revealing himself and stuff like that. There's, there's new things coming out of you. It's what's 
come upon you that, that comes out of you and that what's come in you that goes through you. And so it, it tells us to, to sing a new song. But worship isn't just singing. Our lives, the way we live them, is worship. Uh, you, you can offer the sacrifice of praise. It says, therefore, let us continue to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. In Hebrews 13, 15, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. When we thank him, when we sing to him, of course, there's a lot of worship there. But there's also, our, our giving can be worship. Our activities we can do it as unto the Lord. The, the word that's used uh, 59 times that we get the word Worship from the English in Strong's 4352, proskinu. I probably said it a little bit off, but it, it means to, to lie face down and to, to kiss the ground or kiss towards the, the object of affection. My friend uh, used to have a dog. This guy I know used to have a dog that he wouldn't allow to kiss him, but the dog wanted to kiss him. And that dog, this little excuse for a dog, um, would get like right here and go. And to me, it was real annoying, and it wasn't even my face it was next to. But I thought that was kind of the affection, right, that the dog wanted to display. That was the kind of love. And, and you know, in shaka, which is the Hebrew word that we get a word worship from, it means to be pressed, to, to uh, be prostrate, and to fall down flat, to humbly beseech, to do reverence, to stoop. There's the Greek, three main Greek words. One of them I told you, 4352, meaning to kiss. Uh, or like a, a dog might even kiss your, your hand. Some people, you know, have that in their dog relationship. Um, it originally carried the idea of subjects falling down to kiss the ground before a king or kiss his feet. There's another one, 4576, symbolum, which means to reverence or to hold in awe. It's ten times. And then there's Laturo, which means to render, to render religious service or homage. That one's used 21 times in the uh, New Testament, you'll find it. So there's this whole thing of worship that doesn't always mean singing, but that's what we usually how we look at it, right? We go, this is the worship section. And sometimes I even like to try to clarify to, that well, this is the song portion of our worship service. So this is where we sing. And there is something great, and it is in the Psalms, about singing. In, in worshiping. And it, it's something that we see. If you want to look with me in Revelation chapter 5, I'm just going to go two places and go through them pretty quick. In Revelation chapter 5, they sang, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. It says just right before that that you know there was the prayers that came up that, that God heard and kept every one that was in the, that bowl of incense. But we have this heavenly throne room scene. And as we have this heavenly throne room scene we, we know that as they take this one more new song like it says in Psalms. They're never exhausting new songs. And we have it. It can be an old song to us. And we've, a lot of people have put music to it and everything else. But it's wonderful about God's worthiness. Now remember, this is a guy who later was really um, torn up as he sees this. John the Baptist was, was thrashed. He, he's looking at the hopelessness of man earning his way to heaven, uh, the, the, the plight of sin and the darkness of it and everything else. And, and it's like, who is worthy to open the scroll? Says, There's a scroll that needs to be opened, but it can't be opened. And says, who's going to open the scroll? How's this going to happen? And then he sees the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth. He is worthy to open the scroll. And as he sees the Lord and a lamb who was slain, he sees the Lord in his sacrifice. He's a, he's a, heaven declares his worthiness and everything else. Out of that breaks forth a new song. It's, uh, 
as the lamb stands there in their midst as though it had been slain. And you know, there is something to that in worship. When we look and we know that lamb was slain for me, that lamb was slain for me personally, that lamb is worthy to pay for my sins, to cleanse me, there is a song that breaks forth in our heart, a song of his worthiness, a song of um, a declaration of, what does it say there, redemption. They see that and they realize that's the beauty of knowing Christ, having that personal relationship. And it is, like, like Renato was saying earlier, sometimes we forget about his love and we've heard it and everything else, and we can do the same thing with redemption and salvation and everything along those lines. But when we sit there and just take the time and the silence and the quietness and worship him in prayer, worship him in a song, and worship him in what he empowers us to do, we will be blown away. He's redeemed us by his blood. And he's done it out of every tribe, tongue, kindred, and nation. From Ecuador to, I don't know who's the farthest north person here. Who's really white? Let me see. Uh, <laughs> might be me. Uh, and I'm from Southern California. So... <clears throat> In this scene, who's ever thought about this scene of this heavenly scene when we're there? And who's ever thought, I wonder what kind of seat I'm going to have? <laughs> Anybody ever thought that? Around this throne and all these people? I mean, there's every tribe, every tongue, and every kindred and nation. There's thousands upon thousands upon ten thousands, which is like this huge number. And I'm, you know, am I going to be in a nosebleeder seat? Am I ever going to get a backstage pass? Uh, how, how close can I get up to worship? It's interesting to, to consider that, but remember Jesus, didn't he say that he's going to go away and by his spirit it's going to be better because he's not going to leave us as orphans? I think God's got this all planned out. I really do. That's one thing I trust. I'm not going to be at the MVD taking a number, you know, to when can I talk to Jesus a little bit face-to-face -face and close. Um, I don't know how he's going to work it all out, but I believe he is going to work it all out, just as I believe he hears every prayer to you. Just as I, I, be, and I, I believe he's hearing my prayers when I know there's other people praying. There's other people praying with bigger problems. There's other people praying, a lot of times I think, with smaller problems that I don't know why Jesus just doesn't ignore and take more, you know, I would think to my problem because it's more pertinent. And then sometimes I feel convicted because I know there's other people, and so then I'll pray for them in the middle of somewhere I'm praying for myself sometimes, too often. But I believe we can do that. And I believe each of us throughout eternity will be in close proximity, intimately, with the Lord as part of the body of Christ. The... Lisa and I have had many experiences since 1982. We felt beach breezes on our face. I can re remember, and she talked about the first time when I, on the first date, and I, I grabbed her hand going to the Knott's Berry Farm. And we still, as my parents did, before we go to sleep at night, 90% plus of the time we hold hands. Uh, she rubs my feet with her feet. Uh, she has had trouble sleeping in previous cast months. I'm just, and, and there's a reason I'm, gonna sh I'm sharing all this kind of real personal stuff. I, I remember when she gave birth to Nicole the next day, my stomach hurt. I was grunting with her to such a degree. I'm serious, my stomach was sore. She did not seem to have a bunch of sympathy and I could not get much of an audience with any other individual except for a few of my bros. Um, <laughs> you know, with what she went through. But that's the truth. We've had many special meals together. We've enjoyed great smells in the forest and the fields. We've, uh, we've seen beautiful sights. We've heard wonderful sounds. The birth of our, our grandbabies, our, a piano recital, whales in the ocean, 
We've been through a car wreck where we both had injuries simultaneously, and I've been through several different things. Uh, we both had something touch our spirit. I remember last July, or, or two Julys actually, in Oregon, we were listening to some people give a testimony about what they went through with their daughter in Corvallis at a conference, touching both our spirits. I remember what it was like being away when we got the phone call that Zach had been airlifted off of a 95 uh, from the motorcycle rack, and just being, or having our hearts wrenched. I remember the feelings of seeing Aria and uh, the precious moments uh, that we've had at other times. All these things that involved a lot of different parts of our, our body. You know, it talks about the body of Christ, right? One's a foot, one's a hand, one's a nose, one's an eye. We've had all kinds of different experiences that have touched all parts of our body. But I don't go, you know, remember that one nose time we had together? <laughs> remember that one mouth time where we tasted this? Or that one, man, it was super hot time and our skin felt like that. All different cells. We're made up of millions of cells, right? But it was just me and my wife. It's just the bride and the groom is what it was. We got a lot of different cells here, right? We're all part of the body. But there's an experience that I believe we'll have throughout eternity where each one, each bride, the bride of Christ as a whole, is close to the groom throughout eternity. It's not individualized and parted out just like our bodies are, to, to uh, take a number or, man, I wish I could get closer. That is worship when we're, we're, we're there close. And uh, that's his desire to bring us close. And I think he's got it all figured out. And what he desires of us is, is true worship from the heart. Turn with me to Matthew 15. I'll get ready to close it up. Jesus had talked to them about vain worship in verse 9 of chapter 15. I quoted it earlier. And they, they, uh, they were just, the religious people were not catching nothing. And Jesus talked about them being, you know, one way on the outside, but nothing on the inside and everything else. He talked about the heart and how evil things proceed out of a messed up heart. And it says in verse 21 of Matthew 15, Then Jesus went from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O son of David. My daughter is severely depressed. Excuse me, severely demon-possessed. And probably depressed. <laughs> I, I know that I would be. And she uses this term to cry out to him. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. He's bothering me. Who's ever struggled through this passage? Who's ever that's kind of got their hearts and go, Well, you know, it seems a little tough at the beginning for sure. I mean, how much testing of the faith needed to go on there? And, and I've heard it commentated on that way that, oh, she needed her faith tested and some different things like that. And uh, he, he, he got his priorities straight. And, he, you know, it, it, it's uh, interesting. He says in Mark 7, he says what would correspond to verse 26. He said, but I got to feed the children of Israel first. It's a little softer in Mark, which is interesting because Mark's the servant action gospel, but it's a little softer. But he, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of Israel. I, I wonder how many times she'd heard all the Jewish people and around hearing stories and everything else and how we see uh, his favorite title was Son of Man, but there were several times they called him Son of David. The, G, the lineage of the line, right? Son of David. Now, Son of David is a definite Jewish 
messianic terminology, title. And so he's not answering her word, and he's definitely not doing what the disciples wanted to like, get rid of her. And he speaks out in the hearing of all. And he says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then something happens in verse 25. It's easy to miss. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She's not coming with any other title by anybody else. She's not coming, she's coming not as a, a Jewish person and heard a title like there's some magic mantra or there's something else that she might be able to, to do. To like, like to, to, you know, like when the sons of Sceva got beaten, the, the demon goes, well, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? And whap, whap, whap. She goes, you know what? I, I don't, I'm not coming pretending. I'm not coming with religion. I, I'm not coming, I'm coming broken going, I know who I am. I'm not someone who's even got a right to call you that title. I'm not Jewish. I tried it. I thought it might work. She goes, I'll tell you who I am. I'm just somebody broken with a daughter who's demon-possessed. And I, I'm just bowing down before you, and I'm worshiping you as the one who can help me, the one who has the answer, the one who has the power, the one who is, uh, rightfully can receive my adoration, can rightfully receive my worship. And she says simple words, Lord, help me. She declares his lordship. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. If there's a, a verse that I would love to have the, the tone and the facial expression and everything else. Because I tell you, as I've grown to know the Lord longer, it's changed how I look at this verse. I look at it like, it's, it's not good to, to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And I like what Mark gives us. And, and if, you know, I've got to feed them first. There's, there's a program here. But I'm, I'm answering you and I'm speaking to you and I'm not ignoring you. And I've given you a hint already when he said the lost sheep and, and she's broken. And she's actually worshipped now. There wasn't any band there. Was it like some minstrels that popped out? You know, and she goes, I'm going to get my worship on. No. She said, Lord, help me. That was worship. Lord, help me was worship. Thank Lord. You throw it to the little dogs, and she answers it, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And he put her right in the place where the blessings could flow. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What a great worship service we see in Revelation. And what a great worship service there was on that road by that Syrophoenician woman. Amen. Father, I pray that what you have for each of us tonight as you speak to our hearts as we hear your word as we sing to you Lord that um, we would be drawn closer and that fragrance of your presence that filled the room when Mary broke the alabaster jar would, uh, would stick to us Lord there would be a sticking to us of that aroma when we go home tonight when we leave this place set apart for a, a time of gathering. Lord, um, saturate and infiltrate our lives and cause us to look forward to the intimacy, the familiarity, the close proximity that we have with you for all eternity promised to us. And all this, your people pray in Jesus' name, and they say,